So, hey, what would it be like for a super advanced race of aliens to like come down and teach us about how they see the universe? That'd be a crazy experience. I bet it would blow our minds, right? Well, read the law of one and that's the experience you have. There is just one of you that needs to hear this message and awaken to this message. Love is the exact opposite of ego. So ego has to be sort of hesitatingly convinced that love is actually what it wants. That's where the true value of it comes from because it's truly impossible to genuinely help someone and not feel joy from it. All right, we got Aaron Abke on the Soul Seeker podcast. I am so stoked. I was just chatting with Aaron a little bit before we hit record. We're both from the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. We both were very drawn to the movie Soul. He did a breakdown on YouTube that is fantastic. I did a breakdown on the movie as well. I got to watch yours now, man. Yeah, I'll send you the link. I'll put both of them in the show notes as well for you guys the listening. So you can check out Aaron's and mine as well. But yeah, maybe let's just start with a little bit of your story growing up. Not too much, but I know that you grew up as a pastor's son and that was part of your identity. And then you became a pastor. Can you just speak a little bit like fast forwarding to your experience of becoming a pastor and how you, uh, you left the church and found spirituality? Yeah, sure. I'll give you the, the cliff notes on it. Yeah. So yeah, I grew up as a pastor's kid, evangelical church, my church was really, really great church. It wasn't like a super rigid fundamentalist church. So I grew up really like, you know, free spirited with my spirituality and was very devout in my love for God. And so, you know, see my dad be a pastor my whole life and beginning to work in church, you know, doing music and stuff as a young kid and teenager, like I was already involved in church. So naturally as conditioning lend, I wanted to be a pastor like my dad and do church ministry. So as I pursued that, I went to college at ORU, graduated, got my first church job at 23 as a worship pastor full time at a church back where I grew up in San Jose, actually. And it was a very legalistic, fundamentalist kind of church that I wasn't used to. And growing up, we sort of used religion as a dirty word. Like, oh, that's so religious, man. Like, just love people. Jesus loves people, right? That was kind of who we were as Christians. Mm -hmm. So religion was already a bad word, but it was like, now I'm literally listening to people talk about, you know, everyone else is going to hell except for us because we're the one true denomination or whatever, all these homeless people around our church, because we were in downtown San Jose, you know, they're all going to go burn in hell forever. If we don't go out and preach to them, guys, it was like constantly that kind of stuff. Right. So I'm sitting in these staff meetings every week and on Sunday morning and Wednesday night meetings and hearing this jargon all the time. And it was just like grading nails on a chalkboard in my consciousness. And so it forced me really quickly to make a decision. You know, is this the version I believe of God or not? And the answer was an obvious, strong, no, it's not. I don't believe that this is how God really is. But I realized I didn't know who God could be outside of the religious context. So everything just kind of unraveled for me really quickly in terms of, you know, going from there is a God, this God is loving, and I'm going to be in heaven with this God forever to closet atheist in like two weeks. So that's a really, if anyone's ever had that shift happen, like out of a religion or even a cult you know what a sort of soul sucking feeling that is your whole paradigm of reality gets inverted and you don't know up from down anymore. So I was trying to find myself in that mess, got drawn into reading NDEs for a while. I read dozens and dozens and dozens of them every day for about six months. So I went through thousands of these NDEs because I, it was giving my soul the proof it wanted <clears throat> to believe that there is a creator. There is a source that we could call God. And then that God is love and is good. And that's what all these NDE experiencers were saying. So then I started to get really excited about rediscovering God with a clean slate. So I'm kind of like, okay, let's just study a bit of everything and see what other people have to say about God, other religions and worldviews. So Hinduism, most especially, and then Buddhism and Taoism and Sufism, Christian mysticism, and just kind of ran the full gambit, reading text, studying text for about four years of my life obsessively. And then that got me to a place where I was sort of, as we say, ripe for a experience of oneness and a, a mystical experience that happened to me at 27 when I was working at Google. 
Could you speak to that a bit? Yeah. So I was suffering a lot during that time because again, grew up Christian, all my family and friends are Christian. I had a, I got married at 23 to my Christian, you know, wife who I was celibate with and stuff. Like I did the whole shebang, right? So I lost all of that, got divorced at 26, moved back from Oklahoma, back in with my parents at 26, which nobody wants to do and started working at Google as a trainer and didn't have any friends or social life. Cause you know how the Bay area is <laughs> totally. Yeah. Not conducive for social life at all. So I'm like alone in an apartment by myself, you know, feeling the shadows of my past, the guilt and the shame. And the, I lost every friend I had. Most of my family kind of disowned me as a heretic other than my parents and sister really. So I, I was in this kind of feeling of rejection and aloneness and I was really depressed. And so I would go up to this balcony above my gym every day to listen to Eckhart Tolle and, you know, eat, eat my lunch or whatever. And I did this every day for three or four months because it was like the one time a day that I had real peace of mind when I could just go relax and listen to Eckhart at lunch. And then one day there was a certain lecture that Eckhart was giving and I was listening to where he was kind of mocking things that the ego says in our head and very comically and, and jovially and stuff. And he would say a line and then sort of giggle his Eckhart Tolle giggle. Then the audience would all giggle. So I started laughing with, with them like this. And he did like four or five of them. He would say something like, if only people would recognize how special I am, then I would truly be happy. And then he would go ha, 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 and laugh. And so after the fourth or fifth one, I sort of laughed myself into a powerful realization of something, which was that I couldn't possibly be the thoughts in my head because I recognized Eckhart talking about them to such a comical extent. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what my ego says. And then it was like my ego, that doesn't make any sense. It's the same ego. I'm like, oh, then it's definitely not me. I'm not everyone's ego. Just it happened like that. And I was in this oneness state and everything was just perfect and pristine and brimming with intelligence. And I'm like, wow, this world has changed before my eyes. And I was so happy and free that I didn't really care to think much about what had happened. I was just like, whoa, something just shifted. And this is very lovely. Whatever I'm experiencing, I had no words for it at that point, really. That lasted for two weeks straight, unbroken, like a constant high on oneness. Until two weeks to the day, I wake up to my alarm and I look at the clock and it had been, I noticed it was two weeks to the day that that experience had happened. And this first ego thought came back online and said, wow, it's been two weeks in this state. I wonder if I'm enlightened. Maybe I did it. Maybe I'm not going back to that old state of consciousness. That would be quite nice. And so I didn't catch that right as the first ego thought because I didn't have the wisdom back then. And it, it took an identity again and started thinking its own thoughts again. And then the ego is back. And then it was back with a vengeance because it didn't appreciate that I locked it in a broom closet for two weeks while I was off having an affair with oneness, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so it punished me very severely in terms of my suffering increased, my hopelessness for life increased because it was like, hey, you just got, you know, imagine a, taking a, a prisoner, a slave in a foreign country, he gets to live two weeks in a royal palace and then gets thrown back in that prisoner's cave again. It's going to be even harder to bear that prison now because he's tasted what's available. It's kind of how I felt on top of this kind of guilt of like, dude, the universe just gave you a free sample of enlightenment and you screwed it up because you don't even know how to recognize your own ego. And so there was guilt and there was bitterness and disappointment. So all of these emotions were my catalyst to kind of just walk out of my life completely. Like I was bodybuilding, fitness modeling full-time, working as a trainer. I kept my job just because I had no other skills that could get me money, but I was out of the vanity and the fitness industry in a heartbeat at that moment because I knew it had nothing to offer me in terms of real inner fulfillment. So it was like no judgment, but I'm not gonna wander in that desert anymore. And I just devoted all my time to spiritual seeking because it was like, hey, what else really matters in life anymore? Like if that kind of heavenly state of consciousness is available and I'm just going to settle for like suffering and being lonely, like what? No way, man. Like that's not going to be my fate. I'm going to get back to that state no matter what it takes. 
And so just from diligent seeking daily for that span of a few years, some helpful gems along the way that the universe for sure responded to me with, like the three beliefs of ego, I was able to sort of just slowly day by day begin back engineering into that state through the understanding of what actually causes that state, what actually allows the mind to stay in that state is the important question. And when you have the right question with sincerity, the universe likes to give you the right answer. That's an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing that. And spontaneous, it reminds me of listening to Adi Shanti and hearing of his spontaneous awakening. And yeah, you know, very similar. Yeah. And so something that comes up for me, because my book, Soul Life Balance, A Guide to Igniting and Integrating Spiritual Awakenings is specifically called Spiritual Awakenings, plural, as because uh, it's alluding to mm -hmm. spiritual awakening experiences. I am not of the belief, I'm of the belief that most of us are not going to be in a constant state of awakening. And I know you speak of enlightenment, how we can reach enlightenment. So I would love to hear directly from you, your experience in kind of a path to enlightenment, because would you, and I know this is more of a topic than a question. So I'll say that, but I'm trying to think it through here. Like right now, we should probably talk about your Kundalini awakening you had a few years after that, and we'll get into that. But would you say like right now you're on an ongoing state of enlightenment? Yeah, see, that's always the interesting question, how to describe, you know, what it's like, because it isn't experienced like I'm in a state, you know, mm -hmm. it's more like all these such and such things have kind of dropped away for me. Like, the ability to feel sad at the idea that I've lost something or someone has just kind of dropped out. I just don't feel sad anymore when loved right. ones pass because I just know that they're not dead. And in fact, I feel very happy for them. It's like, what an amazing accomplishment. You just finished a human lifetime. I don't understand why we would grieve over that rather than celebrate it. So your, your, your perception of reality just slowly shifts over time. I like to use the cruise ship analogy, right? If you're turning a cruise ship, it just takes a long time for that ship to finally make a 180 degree turn. And so it's like that with, with your own spiritual journey, just every day, keep turning that ship a little bit more from separation to unity, from fear to love, right? And over time, you look back and go, hey, when did I stop suffering over these and these and these things? You kind of don't even know, right? Because it's so gradual that it happens like falling asleep or something. It's like, slowly and all at once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. And I love what you said about celebrating the life then and death, because that that's a paradigm shift right there for all of us. Like if as a collective, it, grief is important, I will say that. But if we could applaud and that be like the bigger thing, as opposed to getting caught in the grief cycle, and I align and resonate so much with the death conversation. And that's been something that's been massive with my spiritual awakening of not mm. being afraid of my own death. Luckily, I have not experienced direct deaths of my direct family members since my spiritual awakening, my big one in 2019. So I'll be challenged with that, right? Really be have that put to the test, but that definitely does resonate with me. Could you speak a little bit to about your Kundalini awakening? Yeah, sure. So let's say about 2019, I was still in the midst of really just tremendous spiritual seeking like all day, every day, no matter what I'm doing, I'm watching my mind and just obsessed with correcting the errors going on. <laughs> yeah. And I started having weird physical symptoms of like, first, it was sort of hot pinpricks. We've all felt these, I think at times, like a it feels like a burning hot needle, like someone just stabbed it into your skin somewhere. And you're kind of like, ow, and you want to rub it. Mm -hmm. That would start happening more and more to where I'd get multiple at the same time. And it was like multiple times a day. So I start doing research of like, what's this? Is this a neurological condition or what's going on? And then it also was kind of becoming this sensation of, I call it like liquid lava moving through your, it's not your bloodstream. It's like the meridians of your nervous system because it runs especially down the forearms and into the hands, down the shins, into the feet, down the back of the neck. So it's like these meridian layers start lighting up with heat and you can almost feel it flowing and it's it feels extremely hot, but it's not painful. 
but it will like, for example, wake you up in the middle of the night because you'll feel your body like burning, but you don't feel hot temperature wise, like you're not sweating. So it's a very interesting sensation. <clears throat> I would wake up with that almost every night at a certain point. And if I was sitting on the couch, for example, reading a book or something, the legs and the shins would start lighting up with this stuff. So it's like something about being at rest is making this energy move through my nervous system. So I'm doing research online, like what is this? And eventually find things about Kundalini symptoms and whatnot. So I didn't know anything about Kundalini at that point, other than what the average Joe knows about it. Like, oh, isn't that when people say that they feel like a lightning bolt shoot up their spine or whatever, and all their chakras explode or whatever. That's all I knew back the then. The average spiritual Joe. Yes, the average yeah, spiritual yeah. Joe. Yeah. <laughs> the spiritual is implied. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Because I was thinking, I was like, yeah, I don't think most people know that. But yeah, 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 totally. The average secret. Yeah, for sure not. But yeah. yeah, most of us just think of Kundalini awakening as the lightning bolt, which is one element of a Kundalini awakening and is common in Kundalini awakenings. I prefer the term inner conjunction for that which we can talk about if you want later. But essentially, I started doing Kriya Yoga after reading Autobiography of a Yogi. He has that whole chapter on Kriya, which just intrigued me. And I'm like, okay, he's talking about it can, it can help to facilitate the Kundalini awakening. And I can't remember how, they, how Yogananda puts it, but I was like, this is what I need. So it turns out it's not easy to find Kriya Yoga online because it's one of those yoga lineages that's supposed to be very secret only only passed down from guru to disciple so the only thing you'd really find would be like well go find a local kriya temple and get a guru and learn how to do it right mm -hmm. so i'm like that's not really going to work for me so i just kept looking and looking and found some forum boards and different websites where people were teaching it and then eventually i realized that yogananda had a book called kriya yoga art of super realization it's a very short little book and so i read that and he gives the basic Yogananda version of Kriya, which is kind of like spinal breathing, started doing that twice a day, and then really got obsessed with yoga through doing that and started adding in techniques from Hatha yoga, and Kundalini yoga, of course, mantra yoga, and just so many different things that I was learning about that help stimulate and facilitate Kundalini energy. So I kind of created this routine that I would do every morning with a lot of breath work, a lot of bandhas and kumbhakas and retentions and things. And it just was my magnificent obsession for a while. And my kundalini started really going more active after starting to do that routine daily until eventually I think I built up a, enough of a charge, so to speak, in the root chakra where kundalini is sleeping in a kind of a dormant state. And when anyone puts enough kind of spiritual demand, let's say, on that energy, it has a tendency to kind of awaken and we call that a kundalini awakening, but it's when the a higher level of energy, it's actually the green ray energy of the heart chakra, fourth density energy is activated in the nervous system. And bear in mind that it's only a small fraction of the true potency and power of like a true color green fourth density energy. We're like in lime green, barely green, right? But just the first shade of green is going through our nervous system, which is upgrading it to kind of a higher frequency level so that now we can, we can have oneness experiences very often. And it's actually not that difficult to ground our awareness in that state. And we might even notice we have spiritual gifts that are manifesting physical healing, you know, telepathy, clairvoyance, clairaudience, these are like very common symptoms of somebody who has a kundalini awakening because literally your whole nervous system is now operating at a higher frequency level. And so it's an amazing experience that anyone who's on a devoted spiritual path can and will inevitably experience, but there's certain things you can do in terms of yoga and daily practices to really accelerate that path. So that happened to me in 20, 2019. No, I'm sorry. 2021 was when the inner conjunction happened where I actually had the lightning bolt event and all of that. And then from there, just things made a radical turn in my consciousness in terms of this kind of loving awareness. I, that was the, the biggest sort of effect I would say that I had noticed in the quality of my consciousness was that exactly what they, the ancient yogis say happened. My heart opened. Like I'm, I, now I see the world with loving eyes and I realize it's all sacred and beautiful and innocent. 
and I want to protect it and I want to be of service to it. That's really the attitude that wakes up in you when, when Kundalini awakens. And so you can't mistake somebody with an awakened Kundalini because if they don't have that kind of radiance to them, that energy of love, then their Kundalini isn't awakened yet. So it's a clear indicator. Hmm. Interesting. And how, well, I guess that's not important, but okay. So go on. <laughs> yeah. Kriya, Kriya Yoga is the name of the book by Yogananda that taught you this. Yeah. Kriya Yoga, Art of Super Realization. Okay. Is that a hard book to find then? I don't think so. I got it on Kindle actually. On yeah. My I'll, phone. I'll put a, I'll find it on Amazon. I'll put it in the show notes. Cause I'm sure there's definitely going to be some people curious about that, including myself. I, I had a spontaneous experience once with the fit for service community, and we were doing a standing breath work. And at this mm -hmm. point in time, I was probably doing breath work daily and, you know, really in the thick of my journey. And we were in community, probably like 40 of us, give or take, doing standing breath work and like not rolling ohms, but like mantra work, rolling mm -hmm. mantras and kind of like a creative way that Aubrey, Aubrey Marcus, the, the creator of Fit for Service had us do it. It was really unique. And I felt exactly what you were describing. And I, I almost felt like a Bufo reactivation, like 5-MeO DMT, like kind of going to that Samadhi place. Mm -hmm. And I was standing... And it was so interesting because afterwards I didn't, I didn't know what it was. And I, I thought I was going to fall over. And afterwards, one of the, the women, she mentioned that she'd been practicing Kundalini and she described what she experienced and said she had a Kundalini awakening. And I talked with her afterwards and I was like, what you described you felt is what I felt. It, so I'd never been able to really you know, have much more other than that. Definitely have had some very, very interesting experiences. The first night of my yoga teacher training in Costa Rica, we were just doing a very gentle flow, you know, a gentle vinyasa flow. Mm -hmm. And I think it was through a sun salutation. And I literally dropped to my knees. I was totally disoriented. Yeah, wild. But wow. anyways, all of this is really fascinating. I personally am going to check out that book. I'm curious because you have been, and just hearing you speak, it's like you're perfectly suited to be a spiritual teacher because you got to see your father as a pastor. You became mm -hmm. a pastor as well. And now like you, you've had all of that formal training and you're such a student going into these different things. So it's really like clicking, talking with you, which is so cool. So one of the things I was going to say is I love how you distill the law of one and the raw material, which we will definitely get into and make it accessible for people that have never heard about it before, especially since the material is not only dense, but it's, there's a lot there as well. Yeah. There's what, like four books or something? 106 sessions. Yeah. Uh, Five books. Five books. Got it. Yeah. So anyways, I'm curious, since you were looking into Kundalini and, or specifically Kriya and you couldn't find anything on it and you are someone who takes information and makes it accessible for others, do you have content around Kriya Yoga then? So I have a, probably four or five videos on Kundalini and going more into the science of that and the energetics of that. I teach Kriya Yoga in my 4D university course. Got it. There's three courses. And in the first course, you learn Kriya Yoga and you do that as part of your daily practice in conjunction with the, the content of the curriculum. But then the third program is called 4DAP, which stands for Fourth Density Ascension Protocol. Because what the Law of One showed me, and this was something that I just realized from reading the Law of One and being such a student of it, when I had my Kundalini Awakening, I thought this can, this can only be an activation of fourth density consciousness, right? This is like the green ray body coming into activation, like the law of one talks about. And sure enough, actually somebody years and years later, very recently, actually, maybe less than a year ago, found a channeling session from Quo, which is another entity that the LNL research team has channeled. And they channeled, they've channeled Quo for like 20 years or something. And so a, a session from like, I want to say 2008 or something, 
they actually ask Quo if Kundalini awakening is the same thing as the green ray energy, the green ray body coming into activation. And Quo says, yes, that is, that is what you call Kundalini, the green ray body. And I'm like, I knew it because I, I knew the law of one, which shows that the fourth density is the love density. And I'm like, it literally feels like love awakened in me. Like my heart was asleep and now it's awake. Yeah. What, if that's not fourth density, I don't know what is. <laughs> yeah. I love it. There's, there's so much here. So before I follow up on some of the things you just said, I also want to ask you about the CAP. Are you familiar with KAP, the acronym? I've heard of it. Yes. Yeah. So I literally just came across someone who is a CAP facilitator, which stands for Kundalini Activation Process. And I've never heard of that before. So I was, you don't know much about it then? I don't know much about it. I know it has to do with like Shakti pot from what I understand. Yeah, I, I was just curious if you might know anything about it because I hadn't heard about it, but apparently you work with someone who kind of does ener energy work, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Activates the Kundalini in you. So, so here's what I'll say about that because that's an important distinction that there's more than one approach to awakening Kundalini. The traditional approach in you know, even the Yoga Sutras talk about this a little bit is called Shakti Pot, where a guru who has an awakened Kundalini can actually put their hand on a student's head. And I don't know if it's something that the guru feels or intuits or whatever, but they, they know that they either can, or they just have chosen that this person is ready to have their Kundalini awakened. And so they'll actually touch their head and, and the person will have the inner conjunction right then and there. But the caveat is that the guru always knows who's really ready for this energy to awaken because there are, uh, let's say, pretty dire psychological consequences associated with it because Kundalini is basically Shakti, the divine feminine goddess from Hinduism, who comes to the Hindus describe it as Shakti awakens in the root chakra and makes her way up to her lover Shiva, the divine masculine at the third eye. And so she will do anything it takes to get to her lover. She'll burn through anything, break through any wall. She will let nothing stop her. And so that means every remnant of third density consciousness, which is separation consciousness or ego consciousness, that's where humanity currently is. Any remnants of third density consciousness still alive in you, she's going to burn through them and force them out one way or another. And what that looks like is a whole lot of sometimes crazy mind activity will start. Your mind will start racing all day long and you're thinking some really dark stuff. And it's like, it starts to get overwhelming and you're like, get me out of this brain, but you can't escape, right? So what are you going to do about it? And Kundalini kind of puts you in a position where she's going to force you to love and forgive all your thoughts. And so you'll feel emotions come up, traumas from the past. And a lot of people who don't know what's going on think that they've gone crazy. They're like, oh, this is what going crazy is. So they run to a Western medicine doctor who puts them on a bunch of psych drugs because they don't know what the hell it is either. And then they're in a you know, psych ward a few months later and don't know how they got there. Psych wards are full of people with Kundalini problems who could be facilitated if they had found the right person. So my approach to awakening Kundalini is not the Shakti pot way because I wouldn't want to be the judge of who's really ready for this to happen or not. And then get that wrong and have someone, sometimes they'll commit suicide or they'll, again, end up in a psych ward. These things can happen in a worst case scenario. So for me, it's like, I want someone to have a Kundalini awakening because they've earned it spiritually. And so that's where the, what 4DAP, the third program is all about is, firstly, it's teaching over 12 weeks, the full, you know, yoga routine I was doing each morning, which is a kind of yoga slash breath work technique, it takes about 30 minutes. And I call it neurotropic breath work, but I won't get into that right now. I teach them that. And then I also teach the students about a Kundalini awakening, the science of it, why things happen, how to ground the energy if it gets out of control or how to stimulate it if you wanted to get a little bit more intense and everything in between. So I think it's, for me, it's something that a person has to earn through their own spiritual effort because by the time they do, they'll be ready to facilitate that awakening, right? You'll have all the bandwidth you need to meet whatever arises after that with love and forgiveness.
Yeah, thank you for saying that. I think that's a very important distinction and point there. And what's what comes up for me is just integrating spirituality. And this could come from a spontaneous awakening, such as what you've experienced, Kundalini awakening, or through plant medicine. And one of the things that you mentioned was like the mind and the chatter intensifying. I do believe that especially because I work with a lot of people that journey with plant medicines that in the integration, it can potentially get for lack of a better way of putting it worse before it gets better. Like, oh, like yes. you have anxiety, you have extreme anxiety. Yeah. Could you speak to that at all? Cause I think there's, there's definitely people listening that it would help them to hear this message and kind of what to do with that and know that they're perfectly fine and Mm -hmm. and kind of best tools to integrate and maybe even surrender yeah yeah for sure so important for people to understand who are on this path i'll start by saying that if you feel like you're you're going backwards let's say in your development if you feel like your ego is getting noisier busier whatever more attached that's always a good sign that's always a sign of progress because if you're truly asleep in the, in the matrix, so to speak, you don't even know you have an ego. The last thing you're thinking about is, is this my ego or the true me? You know, mm-hmm. when that first discovery is made in someone that, oh, I am something beyond my ego. My ego is like just a mental persona. It's not really who I am. When that happens in you, you're on a downward spiral out of that ego consciousness, whether you know it or not, and whether you like it or not, because it's no different than it doesn't it doesn't matter what movie it is right it could be the best movie ever dune for example i thought was like the best movie i'd ever seen when i watched it a year and a half ago and then we watched it a second time when it came out and then a third time recently and even by the third time the best movie i ever saw i was kind of like yeah i don't i don't want to ever watch that movie again you know i'm good i've seen that i i know the whole plot now can't wait for the sequel though but you can't want to, you, you can't re-experience the movie the same way as you did the first time because it's organic, right? So like that, when you see your ego, the seeing of it is the most important thing. Have you recognized that there is a pattern there? That's it. Have you recognized a lie you're believing? Whatever the illusion is, have you seen it? Then it's in an, it's in an inevitable death process. It does take a long time. And it will lash out and fight for its survival, which can make it seem like it's getting stronger or something, but you don't attack what you're not threatened by. You don't defend something you don't feel is being threatened. When the ego gets attacking and defensive about everything, you know that it knows it's dying. You know that it's very threatened by this new awareness that's awakening in you, and it doesn't want to give up its territory so easily. So first of all, can you just learn to like get comfortable in the uncomfortable is the most important thing. Just don't allow what ego is doing to be a big deal. Like ego's already lost the war and we know that. It can't beat awareness. Once awareness wakes up, the truth will set you free because you can't unsee what you've seen, right? Just like you can't watch the movie the second time the exact same way you watched it the first time. And each time you see it, it wears off even more. The more you're seeing your patterns every day and just noticing them, they get really old really quick. And something in you is like, dude, I'm so ready to be over that. Like what a, what a past mistake that is. I don't want to keep repeating that anymore. And then all of a sudden it'll just drop out and the pattern d- sort of erases itself. And again, it, it happens so gradually, you almost don't even notice it. So if we make a big deal about, well, I'm feeling, I've been feeling really depressed for the last week. It's like, that's because a lot of depression is moving through the ego right now uh, as it's on its way out. So this is where I'm sure you and I share a passion to really teach people the grounding and integration Mm -hmm. of all these, all this spiritual knowledge we have. How do we actually embody it and live it? For me, it's, again, it's just been always returning to love that I have to get to, I simply have to get to a place where I truly love everything. I forgive everything. I have, I want nothing from anything, you know, that open-hearted, true, unconditional love of the creator for all that is. If you ask me what my definition of enlightenment is, it's that. I also like to say everything is relationship. 
Everything about your life and your existence is a relationship. It's an inescapable fact of everyone's existence. You're always in relationship to something in every moment. So enlightenment to me is really just about making all relationships loving. Like not just with people, but making the relationship I have with my mind loving making the relationship I have with my body loving, right? Where am I being unloving to my body? That's a relationship. Where am I being unloving towards my thoughts? That's a relationship. When you make that a priority of like, I want to be in loving relationship with everything, then enlightenment doesn't seem so abstract anymore. It actually seems very practical. And, and you almost feel like, man, how did I not realize this for so long? Like the truth of oneness and love being the most important thing in the universe becomes so childlike in its simplicity and sort of obviousness that you really do kind of feel like, man, how was I so delusioned for so long? How was I asleep for so long? Like love is so obvious and so present. And so that's kind of the barometer, I think, that we all should pay attention to of how normal and, and ordinary and common and, and grounded is love in my awareness? Is love still a challenge for me? Is it, is it hard for me to get beyond myself to love someone or to be of service? If the answer is yes, then really the only spiritual practice you need is just to practice service to others and giving love. Just give, give, give as much love as you can. And that will crystallize anyone's consciousness faster than anything else will. That will purify the ego faster than anything else will. It's almost like the journey really stops being so painful and shadowy and difficult once you really allow love to lead everything because even the ego is invited into it you know it's like even the ego that feels like it's dying love comes by and holds its hand and says don't worry darling you can't really die there is no death like love yeah, just exactly. overwhelms everything with truth and light you know mm -hmm. I love that line. There is no death. I'll always remember one specific ceremony of someone saying that over and over again. So every time I hear that, it's great. So love, this is, that definitely resonates. And one of my biz, biggest messages is self-love over mission, purpose, dharma, all of that. I think that's a narrative to keep us limited. And really what we ought to be doing is finding ways to love ourselves first. As quantum physics teaches us, the outer world is, is a reflection of our inner world. So before going outwardly, we got to go in and find that self-love and then we can radiate it outwardly. Having said that, why is love so difficult for humans? Because <laughs> it should be easy, right? And sometimes it is, right? Right. Yeah. Why isn't it always easy is the question. Mm. And that is because it, it runs in direct opposition to the thought system, you might say, of the ego. L love could be described as giving and receiving because love is relationship, right? Giving and receiving is what love is. Well, does ego want to give or receive? No, it's afraid of everything and it wants to conquer everything. <laughs> so ego wants to take and keep, right? That's ego's thought system. Take and keep, take and keep. Even a sort of special romantic relationship for the vast majority of people is just a take and keep kind of relationship of, hey, I think you're really attractive. So you make me feel special about myself when I'm around you. When you desire me, it makes me feel special. And so I'm going to be in this relationship with you as long as you make me feel special. But if you start looking at other people, if you make me feel unspecial in any way, I'll hate you and I'll dump you. Mm. So it's not love, right? It's ego, right. it's pride and it's fear and it's all those things. So love is the exact opposite of ego. So ego has to be sort of hesitatingly convinced that love is actually what it wants. And that's where I would say the true value of what we could call like karma yoga or service to others. That's where the true value of it comes from because it's truly impossible to genuinely help someone and not feel joy from it. It's yeah. genuinely not possible to help someone in need and not feel happiness return to you in some regard. Even the most, you know, even in movies we watch like villains will have like one moment where they're nice or something. And you can see that they feel like the beauty of love and service and stuff. So it's like, it's in all of us to feel good about helping others. That's why it's touted as a virtue in the culture so much, even though almost no one actually does it, right? Right. So when you start serving other people, it's a way to force ego to get beyond itself 
And then it quickly learns, oh man, this love stuff tastes so good and it, it's so fulfilling and enriching. And eventually we sort of trick the ego into craving love through service to others. And I think the important distinction here, which is what you were pointing out, is that the law of one also says that all service is service to self ultimately. Um, the law of one lays out the two polarities, right? Of service to others and service to self positive and negative. It's not saying that on the service to others path, you never ever serve yourself. It's just saying that all service is seen as service to others. So when I meet my needs, when I love myself and, and uh, invest in myself, I'm doing all of that just from the motive of, cause then I can be of more service to others. The more healed I am, the more happy I am, the more I can make other people happy and healed. So you see there's a mutual interest in your happiness and actually you feel a sense of obligation from the universe of, hey man, if you want to serve others, you got to get right first. Mm -hmm. So it's like, even while you're serving others, you're, you're still perceiving it as this is for my highest good. This is like medicine for me, right? So you're, it is simultaneously in investing in yourself. And what it does to ego is that it just disproves the ego's beliefs that other people are enemies, threats, I should fear them or I should want to conquer them and take their power or something. It disproves all of that when you love people and experience the joy of that service. And so that's why Ra calls it the service to others or positive polarity, because that's the way we transcend our service to selfness, our pride, our selfishness, our greed, and our ego. It's transcended by being of service to others. I think that is absolutely amazing and i've never really had it really hit me like that in terms of like whether we don't feel good about ourselves or we don't feel good in something else to change that state by finding a way of being of service mm -hmm. and that's that's so true because you're right like anytime we're in service and you truly are in service and you're not doing from like an egoic point of view like to check a box you know mm -hmm. or something like that you were at google right so like you have to yep. show up for so like all the tech companies a lot of corporate companies do it right like volunteer to volunteer versus like really wanting to right. volunteer and be of service so i think that's beautiful and that's something that i'm going to incorporate so thank you for that and listeners as well i would encourage encourage you guys to check that out. All right. So I want to get into law of one because we've teased it enough, but I still have so yeah. much more on the list here. One of them is the three beliefs of ego. Could you, and I'm sure you probably kind of spoke to a few of them, but could you tell us what the three beliefs of ego is all about? Yeah. And by the way, I'm happy to do a part two, if we want to do, you know, follow up later. So we'll, we'll get through it all. That. Yeah. So this is what I mentioned earlier when I was talking about how the universe dropped some gems along my path to help me out. One of them was this understanding of initially it began as me really trying to analyze my suffering of like, what is it fundamentally that I am suffering from? Because there's a lot of stories and drama in my mind, right? But what is it really at a deep level? And after thinking about that for some time, it was pretty clear that there's really just three negative emotions. And they could be called sadness, anger, and fear. Now, I'm also a Course in Miracles teacher. And the Course in Miracles says that fear is the only negative emotion. So it's like behind everything is fear. But the kind of fear I'm talking about is more of the primal stress, anxiety, worry, paranoia. So we have these three emotions, sadness, anger, fear, three different flavors of ways you can suffer. Let's call it that. And then once I was really clear on that, the next question came alive, which was, well, if there's three distinct emotions that I can, I can literally tell you which one of the three I'm suffering with, and they all, the suffering is a different quality for each of them, well, then that must mean that there's three sort of like beliefs or foundations that these emotions are coming from, right? Like there must be a reason why I feel stressed out versus angry and irritated or stressed out versus depressed and sad. And that was obvious, like, oh, yeah, there's definitely some kind of cause to why I feel one of these three. So I bet it's some kind of deeply ingrained belief. And so once that was kind of a conviction of, yeah, there's three underlying beliefs behind these three emotions, let's find out what they are. I, it took me, you know, better part of a few years to like really whittle them down to the way I'm going to explain them. And they were refined over time as, you know, I would find better ways to understand things. But 
the first belief of ego, let's say that the three beliefs are kind of the three ways that our belief in separation plays out. Meaning as soon as I think I'm separate, I am separate from the universe, from the source, whatever, God, then my mind will do these three things right away. So that's what the three beliefs are. The first thing that it does is, I just call it the belief in lack. The belief in lack is the first sort of belief the ego has, and it holds these beliefs very near and dear. It's like, they're sort of like the ego's mission statements or something. It's fully convinced of these beliefs, so much so that you don't even know that you believe them until you really sit and think about it and analyze your actions in life. And then you're like, oh, I guess I must believe that, huh? It's, it's more like that because it's so fundamental to what you know of your mind, right? So the belief in lack, scarcity, whatever you want to call it, there's something missing. There's something fundamentally just not here that should be here. And I'm going to call that feeling lack. So lack is what the belief in lack is what causes sadness. Anytime you believe, anytime you're sad, it's because you believe that you have lost something, basically, whether it's love, whether it's a loved one, whether it's an opportunity or money or whatever, but it's all the belief in lack. So I just call that belief. I am incomplete. That's how I'll, I'll phrase it. If the ego had to fess up and explain what it believes, it would say, I am incomplete. The second belief flows downstream of the first belief. Like it really almost happens simultaneously, right? But for the sake of understanding, we can say the next thing ego will believe is that since I'm lacking, I must go and fulfill that lack somehow. I need to complete myself is the feeling, the belief. And what is ego really looking for to complete itself? Kind of hard to pin this one down, right? But the way I like to see, it, and that's been helpful for me, is outcomes. Outcome happiness is the second belief of ego, meaning there is some experience I can go get, I can have more money, more love, more sex, more fame, more of something. And when I get it, it will fill that feeling of lack in my soul. And so we chase the next outcome, the next pleasurable moment, right? Whatever it is, the next high. And in order to chase and go make an outcome happen, you have to believe the third belief, which is, I like to summarize it as, I am the doer, or I am in control. I am the one who makes the gears of life turn through my sheer force of will. I can tell reality what to do. I can make things happen in my favor. I can even resist life itself if I need to, right? That's the doer, the belief that I'm in control of life. So we have, I am incomplete, belief number one. My happiness depends on outcomes, belief number two, and I am in control, belief number three, sadness, anger, and fear. When you don't get an outcome that you really want, what's the emotion? Anger, right? Irritation, frustration, jealousy. Any flavor of anger means a goal got blocked, an outcome got missed, or an outcome got taken. And anger is the energy that ego uses to be like, Go get that outcome, like do whatever it takes, smash through any wall you need to smash through. So it's a useful emotion for getting outcomes, right? And then the third emotion is fear, anxiety, stress, panic, worry. What is a panic attack, right? It's the moment someone feels like they're losing control. They, they don't have control over something anymore. I can't breathe. I can't control my breath. I can't feel my feet. I can't, you know, and then a panic attack. So you believe that you've lost control or are losing control. That's why you get stressed and worry about things. So once I understood these three beliefs, my practice became very simple, which was, I'm just going to pay attention to my emotional state. Am I feeling sad? Am I feeling angry? Am I feeling stressed out or afraid? And based on what emotion I'm feeling, I'm just going to correct the belief that's really at play. Because underneath the story, underneath the thoughts, there is an underlying belief that I have to first believe before ego can get me off on this wild goose chase and lost in stories, right? I have to believe I'm lacking before I can then feel sad about X, Y, Z. So I just started to notice, okay, I'm feeling sad right now. And I would repeat new mantras, like the, the belief I would want to replace ego's belief with. And I would just repeat it to myself until I felt the truth of that belief kind of activate. And as soon as I feel the truth, like something in me says yes to the truth, 
And then I stopped and that was it. That was the practice. Just repeat the truth until you feel the truth. And that was a really potent practice because as many of us know now, Neville Goddard's teachings weren't as popular back then, but the feeling is the secret, right? When you can send a feeling-based message to your mind, it, it remembers things a lot better. And so if every time you're feeling one of those three negative emotions and you correct it with a statement of truth and you feel an emotion associated with that truth, it's a really powerful way to rewire your subconscious. That is incredible. I love that so much. And that's something you came up with, right? Yeah, it came to me. I don't feel like I made it up or something, but yeah. Yeah, it, it, that's another thing that we could talk about as well, like <laughs> ideas and downloads and uploads and and yeah, channel, channeling in a sense, which actually that is a perfect segue into your partnership with Gaia. Could you tell us a little bit about that? You have a new show with Gaia, right? I haven't checked it out yet, but if you're down to a part two, I'll definitely watch it before the next one for sure. Yeah, you'll like this week's episode. Uh, number nine is all about the raw material. Sweet. Which will be fun. Yeah, it's been an interesting and really great relationship, but they approached me like in 2020 or uh, 21, 21. Yeah, it's 2023 now. They said, hey, we saw your YouTube videos. We're big fans. We would like to make a Gaia show out of your Law of One series on YouTube. And I was like, wow, that sounds super fun and exciting. I'm in. So I was actually living in Denver at the time and Gaia is stationed in Louisville, Colorado. Yeah, or Lafayette. So I was like 30 minutes away. So I started driving to the office and met with one of the producers, Jason Liggett, really cool guy. And we sort of planned out an entire like 10 episode Law of One show. And then as things happen in show business, like they had backend shows to work on and they got some, one of the other producers had a new idea and then they did another T.S. Stefano show. So they kept pushing it back. And so in the in-between time, they're like, hey, we're going to get to that Law of One show at some point. But for now, we'd love to have you on to like do guest appearances for these shows. And they were also kind of shows in my alley, like the channeling show that's out now. And then there's another one coming out in June, I believe, called Divine Science, which is also just a really fun show. So it's been a blast and I've gotten to talk about a lot of cool topics, but it's very different than like this, like a conversation, right. because you're just like sitting in front of a bunch of cameras and lights in a studio and it's they're like okay lights you know cameras then the director comes up action and then the producer will ask you a question about some topic and you have to like give a great answer and then like cut and like all right what's the next question and you're just jumping topics like this so you can't really get into a flow in your conversation yeah. and i just feel like i'm just way better at articulating things when i'm in a flow so i always leave those those interviews with Gaia feeling like, well, that sucked. You know, like I didn't, I did not show up my best self today, but oh, well, that's what came out. But then, as you know, you watch it later and you're like, okay, that wasn't so bad. Ego so I'm enjoying back, watching right? it back. What's that? That's the ego coming back. A hundred percent. It's such a tricky voice to number one in the ego beliefs, right? Yeah. I'm not enough. I didn't do good enough in that interview. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which, yeah, it's a, it's a lifelong journey. I mean, you know, and it, it, congratulations on that, by the way, that sounds awesome. And it is interesting that the, there's not many people like teaching the law of one. And as we start to wrap this up, like major teaser, could you just give <laughs> us like a little bit of a glimpse into the raw material and law of one? Yeah, I'd love to. Law of One is my, probably my biggest passion to teach right alongside ACIM. And I would summarize it by saying that it is a channeled text from the 1980s from a group of UFO researchers who were trying to use channeling as a means to contact beings in UFOs in the 70s and early 80s. It eventually made contact with an entity that identified itself as Ra. And Ra is a social memory complex which means a, a group mind or a collective mind. And they are in the sixth density of consciousness. So three densities higher than our planet is in right now, which is a lot in the universe. So they go on this 106 session Q&A with Ra over like a four-year period and just ask it all about the most incredible mechanics and metaphysics of the universe in a question answer format. And Ra doesn't answer all their questions because they said, hey, if we think 
something's not ready for you to know yet, or it's an infringement of your free will, we're not going to tell you. But other than that, ask us a question and we'll answer you. So you really get to see a amazing, very much extraterrestrial kind of view of the universe. If you could, if you could sort of try to imagine, hey, what would it be like for a super advanced race of aliens to like come down and teach us about how they see the universe? That'd be a crazy experience. I bet it would blow our minds, right? Well, read the law of one, and that's the experience you have when you read it, because it's like, wow, I sort of feel like I always knew this stuff, mm -hmm. but I've also never heard it put like this. And it's, it resonates so powerfully, like the seven densities of consciousness or the concept of the logos and the higher self. It's like we have these understandings in the spiritual community, but the law of one puts like scientific, energetic, met metaphysical language around it in a way that you're like, oh yeah, this is spirituality is a science. It is very much a part of reality. It's not like, I don't know, it, yeah, some new age hippie thing. It's actually the structure of reality and Ra explains how and why. And it's just incredibly beautiful and inspiring. And when you read it, you're like, I want to be the best version of me. I want to realize all the divine potential I have and ascend my consciousness as high as I can in this lifetime. Nothing could be more exciting thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's amazing. And I've watched some of your videos on it. I never finished the first book. So I need to go back, I would like to go back and finish the first book and then make my way through the others or ultimately watch your show when it gets released on Gaia as well. And uh, there's another book called The Starseed Transmissions. Have you heard of that one? I've heard of it. Yeah, I yeah, haven't read it though. Yeah, it's not as well known. And I think there's two books. I read the first one. It's by, I believe, Ken Carey. And if my memory serves me correct, I think that book was actually published before the first Raw book, the Law of One book, and very, very similar stories in terms of like some researchers accidentally channeling and then getting in mm. contact with the ET form that was bringing them this information. I forget all the details. It's been a couple of years since I've read it, but to me, like, I'm not someone who is, who doesn't believe this stuff. You know, I'm, I'm all in, I, I believe all this, but if you didn't believe it, like to me that I was like, that's enough proof right there. Because if you want to say it's like a copycat book or something like that, it's like, no, this book was actually published first and it's not as well known. So it goes to show that this stuff is actually happening for anyone that is a skeptic, you know? For sure. Yeah. That's very intriguing. I'm definitely going to give that a read now. Yeah, it's an easy read. I think it's like 100 pages or something like that. Yeah, it's been been a while. I, I read it. The line that struck me most with the Starseed transmissions was they are talking about awakening. And they said, there is just one of you that needs to hear this message and awaken to this message. And that is like, that just gives me chills. Right. And mm -hmm. I, I get lost in trying to understand like the quantum part of this in terms of like this human experience, feeling like a Truman show and, you know, you being a figment of my imagination. And then if you apply that to me and going down that rabbit hole and I don't have answers there, it's, it's since we <laughs> are on the topic, does anything come up for you when I bring up that topic? Like parallel realities and stuff. Kind of like, I, I don't know how to articulate it, but like we're, we're one consciousness, right? And we're split uh. off in the separation and we can intellectually understand that. And I've had experiences mainly in medicine ceremonies of that. And then also in the integration of being awake in the dream with massive God winks, massive synchronicities, not, not like the daily synchronicities, you know, like just so much that's undeniable or all, to a certain extent, it's pretty much scary. It can be for some people, you know, and for me, Sometimes it is more when it's dark because sometimes the darkness comes in. And when you experience the darkness in physical form in terms of these massive synchronicities, that is scary. And I don't know what else to say about that. In terms of what I was saying before, kind of like, let me see if I can articulate this pretty well. And here, here we go with the flow. Like you were talking about, like Gaia cameras, come on now. I got to spit it out, but now you're know, on, give your best answer. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I can understand how that might be. But yeah, anyways, just that no one really exists. I've had these thoughts and feelings sometimes. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. And that like it, you are me and this is all just like a dream and the, you, you don't exist. The listeners don't exist. None of this in like the Truman show, you know, and then the really trippy side of that is when you or someone listening hears that then applies that to Aaron and I not existing and just be your ultimate dream, you know? Yeah. I can give you a really simple and powerful answer to that question. Cool. What do we mean when we say that things are illusions th that doesn't exist? You know, we hear this a lot in like non-duality and non-duality can be used as a powerful way to bypass, to spiritually bypass. So we got to be really careful about what do we really mean when we say that other people don't exist? Well, that's actually true. Like, no, there is no such thing as an individual person or self because there can't be anything but the one source, the one being. So we're all like activities of the one being, but we don't have some kind of independent existence apart from that being. We're not actually individuals. We are connected to the one mind. And that one mind is just having an experience, right? So like, it's true technically that they don't exist. I don't exist. But we, we should always know that that doesn't mean that you and I and the seeming appearance of others and a world and everything that goes on in the 3D, we should never take that to think that that means that this isn't all sacred and holy, and important, and divine, and to be engaged with, and to be met, not to be avoided, and annoyed with, and like, oh, it's all an illusion, you know, it's all Maya. That's mm -hmm. such an egoic approach to non-duality. And so the answer is, let's say you have a child, and your child at, you know, three years old is finger painting, or making art. How much do parents adore their children's artwork, you know, and hang it on the fridge, and keep it in a binder for the rest of their life and stuff. They save it. Even though the, the artwork's not their kid, you know, it's just something their kid did. It's just a temporary fleeting expression of who their kid was at that point in time. doesn't matter to the parent. It's incredibly special and important and unique and beautiful and to be cherished, right? So in the same way, although all physical reality is impermanent, it is what the supreme magnificent being is doing. You know, so we should never see it as, oh, don't worry about it. It's all an illusion. It's such an unloving attitude, right? We should see with wonder and childlikeness and innocence and see that sacredness behind everything. And then, boy, you want to talk about being happy and enjoying your experience of the 3D. That'll do it. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's, that's why I'm so passionate about grounding into this experience because it can right. be so easy to get lost in the seeking. And at the end of the yes. day, it's like, looking for these answers honestly like the part of the reason why i never finished law of one was around the time that was when this was all coming through for me to kind of stop going down those rabbit holes like you know even, yeah there's uh, a time for that for sure yeah exactly and i mean it's it's great to know and there's so many great teachings from the law of one i'm not discounting it in any form but like asking i found myself asking these really big questions that were keeping me out of my body and not physically like like you said kind of being grateful for this experience and there's there's more important work for where i'm at now and i think for a lot of people when they first are going through a spiritual awakening like we want to go down the rabbit holes of who mm. created humans oh did aliens create humans oh what's there's aliens other other entities and it's so fascinating and then after a while you're like Oh, okay, it's time of ground, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, ego yeah. loves that stuff, which is a great honey trap for the ego, right? Oh, um, good point. Yeah. But you can't stay there forever. You got to keep moving. Absolutely. Well, Aaron, this has been fantastic. This has been an hour of just like going down different topics. That is so awesome. I would love to have you on again, do a, a deep dive of really talking about shifting from 3D to 4D consciousness and what that means and the law of one and so much more. But I think for introduction to what you're about and for us to connect, this is an incredible place to probably put a pin in it. Yeah, man, I'd love to come back and talk some more Law of One and all the juicy stuff that awaits for sure.
Thank you, brother. And for everyone listening, thank you guys. In the show notes, you can find all the links to connect with Aaron. I will get them from him in terms of 4D University. That is his 12-week program where you can learn his style of Kriya Yoga and everything he talked about there. The Gaia episodes, all the things are going to be in the show notes. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.